Hi everyone, uh, we're just doing a quick check right here. Hi everyone, uh, we're just doing a quick check right here. That's why we do this. Um, can everyone hear me? It shouldn't be... Okay, cool. And Manuel, can you please talk? Can you please talk? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Manuel here, Manuel Gutierrez. Is it too quiet? Okay, can you guys hear him now? Manuel, please talk. Hello, uh, Manuel Gutierrez here. How is everybody? Can you hear me okay? Yep, I think we're good to go. Um, okay, hi everyone, and welcome today. Uh, we have Manuel. We have Manuel here. Um, he has a really interesting product. Uh, he's going to talk about. Um, Manuel founded uh, Immersion in March 2014, and not too long ago joined forces with Ferilia, um, a Jose Antonio Garcia Marine company um, in Spain, um, to create a company called Immersion Ferilia International. Manuel is also uh, the Alter Space Environment Architect, um, Eileen's Master Architect, and TD Vision CEO and Founder. Um, as a serial inventor and entrepreneur, uh, he founded TD Vision in 2003, providing an entire solution for the full high-def 3D to the home ecosystem in 2006. Um, first in the world to showcase a full high-def 3D uh, HMD in 2008 in the first 3D high-def Xbox video game. His technology has been internationally awarded with a Lumiere Award in 2013 for his contributions to the 3D industry. In 2014, Manuel launched the Alter Space AVR, a, sp a spin-off of TD Vision, providing a parallel digital universe where the Internet of Things, 3D data sets, media, social, work, education, and inter entertainment converged under one single interactive environment powered by Eileen's brain and providing interfaces for augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, control, analysis and media interaction along with Immersion Virilia. Um, so as you guys can see, uh, Emmanuel has had his hands in a lot of things and he's here now to talk about all things um, uh, virtual reality. So I'll hand it off to you, Emmanuel. Thank you very much, Colin. Thank you very much. So um, thanks for the warm introduction and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be speaking uh, a bit of our uh, background, our vision, our current company and the fusion as well as our products and uh, please feel free to ask at any moment if you happen to have any questions uh, regarding our product line or our timeline just don't hesitate on um, asking us uh, directly so um, thank you very much for the for the introduction Colin and um, basically um, we have been in the virtual reality um, field for many years uh, now. Um, we have developed uh, over the years the different uh, pieces of the puzzle along with many other companies in the world that are also creating uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. It's, uh, in the way we see it, it's kind of an evolution of technology where many people in the world is uh, developing uh, some same line of development for, for these applications with a different approach in a different country, but we are all looking for the same convergence of virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, so how do we do that and how can we make it in, in a compelling way? How do we solve uh, the challenges that we have identified over the years um, you name you name it from from the ergonomics uh, to the vestibular system um, differentials or uh, the optics or the field of view or the compression methods to deploy uh, high quality content over the cloud so there are many challenges uh, we have seen many different approaches for broadcasting, for transmitting data sets, um, for creating virtual reality environments and also for augmented reality. Um, so what we did in our company, we decided to put together in one single company uh, tens of years of experience uh, of each one of us combined into creating a complete platform and a complete solution for the environment, for 3D and virtual reality 
and augmented reality, everything into one single platform. And we decided to call it Immersion Vrelia, um, which is a, a, a group of initiatives. Um, we go from um, the, the side of uh, content acquisition, uh, content generation, deployment, uh, the coding or receiving the, the content or accessing the content, and then visualization and interaction with such content. The way we do that is um, uh, with a set of products that we have right now. One of them is what we call the Go version of Immersion Brelia, the Pro version of Immersion Brelia, and the Alter Space. So uh, basically what we're trying to do um, is to integrate and to provide an entire infrastructure for um, the industry and the consumer uh, where they can create their own experiences and put them on the cloud and uh, in that way either private or public um, or something that you want to use like content for as a pay-per-view or paper experience that we have coined a little bit the the term of, of paper experience so um, we allow the people to to create their own environments or their own applications and, and put them in the outer space uh, once you're in the outer space, we call it jumping into the outer space, you can launch these applications and experience them. And for us, the best way to experience them is by using um, a head-mounted display um, targeting a wide field of view and targeting um, a, the best experience for ergonomics and optics. So um, by, by integrating all this expertise in optics, and ergonomics and mechanics, um, we created um, the head-mounted display with two variations. So how can we leverage the possibilities of bringing virtual reality to every single person in the world? And uh, well, there are many ways, but interestingly enough, if I ask you who has a cell phone at this moment in your hand that is running on Android or iOS, everybody does. So what if we could tell you that we can enable any of those cell phones or iPhones to be a portal to a virtual reality environment? That's one, that's one option. And that's what we do with the, with the Go version. We practically enable every single mobile phone to become a portal to the outer space of virtual reality and augmented reality. That's one of our products. And then in the high-end side, for um, for a very extreme immersive experience, we have the pro version of our head-mounted display, which is a, a full high-definition per eye experience with a wide field of view of 123 degrees, and that's uh, the prototype that we are uh, promoting right now. It's called the beta tester unit. Uh, nevertheless, we are including in our uh, timeline to create a wider field of view and a higher resolution device on the Pro. Um, there are many companies that may require this high end of graphics and optics, and, and, and we're talking about military and, and aerospace or industrial and engineering processes. Um, and, and that's where the, where the pro is targeting. That's the, the market that we're targeting with the pro version. So being that said, we are trying to cover a wide uh, set of the spectrum of users. Uh, if we think about all the mobile users for the consumer, for the, um, let's say, the low end of uh, resolution and, and optics. Uh, we have all these possibilities with the, with the Go version. And then for specific applications, we use the Pro version. Now, let's say we have either one of those, either the accessory for the Go to enable every phone or the Pro or any other head-mounted display for this case 
and uh, we know that there are going to be many others and, 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 and we're up for, for very good health competition. So there are many good initiatives out there and um, they offer something different. They, they offer something you know lighter or with less resolution or less optics. We're targeting the high end and the high end experience. Uh, but let's say that any user that has um, this head mounted display of any brand and uh, of any configuration. Well, they want to see content. They want to experience content. Um, they want to learn, they want to entertain, they want to play. Some of them want to work. Uh, where is that gonna happen? Where exactly is the content located? Where, where, is, where are all the movies? Where are all the games? Where are all my documents that I can see virtual reality? Where are, where are my designs? Where are my airplanes or my ships? or my cars, or anything I want to see in the virtual reality world. Well, they are located in the altar space. That's, that's where you'll, you'll find everything. That's where everything is located. It's a, it's a consolidated repository of information where you can find uh, photographs, videos, uh, games, applications, renders, worlds, experiences, all of them suitable for virtual reality immersive experiences. And not only that, but also the capability to enable augmented reality capabilities on a virtual reality environment, which is mixed reality. We call it like augmented virtuality. So what happens is that every single object inside the outer space not only has a virtual representation, but it also contains metadata and information that is, that is probably the most valuable thing that we can find in the virtual world. Metadata, information about the information, information about each object. So when we mix the concept of virtual reality and augmented reality within an immersive experience on a high definition, wide field of view display, head mounted display, then we are really bringing the user to a different world, to a different dimension. And that's what we're offering. That's our products, that's our line, that's our mission, that's our model. We want to make um, the trigger, we want to be the catalyzer for human evolution. Um, games are fine, applications, and entertainment, yeah, th those are fine. We, we, we can all watch a stereoscopic 3D movie immersed in a virtual reality. It's okay, that's fine. Or we can play a uh, first person shooter. That's one, one field. What moves us is education, science, medicine, security, the way we can enhance the experience for students, for doctors, for engineers, for scientists. That's exactly our target. That's what we're targeting. That's what we're looking for. And that's our field. And that's our scope of action. Um, you can see many things in our booth, uh, in our virtual booth right now in the universe. Uh, we have many uh, products, many ideas. We have a timeline. You can check our website um, to find out more. Um, but just to give you a glance and an idea of uh, the projects that we are embarking right now, uh, they have to do with aer aerospace. They have to do with military, with training simulation. And uh, they are all part of what we call the early adoption program um, where we are inviting companies with very creative ideas that they know they can monetize and they can be useful for training and education. And we're inviting them to bring those initiatives into the outer space. We provide the infrastructure, we provide the environment, we provide the technology from deployment, visualization and management and uh, if you happen to have 
a very good idea of um, an environment that you want to bring to or to you want everybody to experience then uh, you can become part of the early adoption program and we, we together will make everyone's great idea to be accessible to every single user in the world that's why we we call our altar space to be um, uh, a portal because technically speaking you can go anywhere you can go anytime you can travel in time you can travel in space uh, you can practically do anything you want uh, and, and, and not only as in the case of socializing and not only in the case of entertaining as I said but then we can we can really take these platforms and, and the great initiatives like the Uterverse to become tools on a on a daily use basis for education and training. Um, we believe that the, the more technology that we pour into education, then the faster the evolution of the next generation of students is going to be. And uh, that's basically our uh, company. That's what we're doing. Um, and calling, I don't know if uh, at this moment anyone has raised hands for questions or um, at this moment, so I, I can probably go on. Just let me know. Yeah, Mandel, uh, keep going, and then when you're done, we'll have a Q&A for you. Perfect. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our background, uh, where do we come from, and um, where are we going, which is our, our vision of the future. Uh, now that I've explained the, the different products that we have in the company, well, um, when I was talking about the different years of experience that we have had in virtual reality and augmented reality and, and immersive experiences, is because um, as many other people in the world, we, we started with the with the vision of bringing the user to a different place, to, a, to an unexisting place, to a digital area. Um, many years ago, uh, when we all started, uh, well, the technology wasn't there. There was no processing power enough to run a virtual world. There were no fast enough computers. It was probably just the silicon graphics with very high-end cards or um, super computers and um, graphics cards that will process the number of polygons to give you a, a, an interesting experience. But um, that, that evolved. That had to evolve. Um, the timing wasn't right. Many people was looking at this happening, but the timing wasn't right, the, the, the platform wasn't there. Just a few companies were actually experimenting with that. And um, over the years, as the technology and the Murphy's uh, um, uh, experience proceeded, um, we, can, we can think about uh, how this um, technology is now available on everybody's cell phone or everybody's laptop or everybody's desktop. So having um, this processing power embedded into every single phone allows you to get access to some things and, 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 and products that were not available before. We have now the processing power inside a phone that is higher than any computer in the 80s. Um, so we're taking a leverage on that and, and uh, Jose Antonio uh, from Brelia and the team in Europe and, and we in, in the United States and Mexico and many people from all over the world, we have, we have target to capitalize on that platform. And uh, how do we do that? Well, we take the maximum performance out of every phone and every computer that we have available to provide the user with the best experience ever. Um, this is basically um, our our approach, and um, in our team we have people that come from uh, universities uh, that have been 
specialized on, on virtual reality and optics and software and firmware and hardware and platforms. And um, we're, we're very proud to say that our company today is holding um, many, many people that is expert on their fields as many other companies are, are trying to do and, and doing together. So um, when we when we decided to go forward with the initiative, I remember back in 1999, it was interesting. It's, it sounds so easy, but so long ago. We decided to create a company and uh, and targeting head-mounted displays and, and, and cameras and encoding, decoding, and deployment. So back then even though when the power the processing power was not there we knew that at a certain point in time the the conditions the environment will be the right one and then we we decided to create from from scratch the entire infrastructure i remember we were demonstrating as you correctly pointed on the, on the, on the introduction uh, calling that um, we were demonstrating head-mounted display, high-definition 720p per eye in 2006 or 7, I don't even remember. And um, we had great content in, in the stereoscopic immersive virtual reality experiences, video and CG. And there was this belief that having a head-mounted display with a personal experience was going to isolate people from their peers from their family and that was probably one of the main stoppers for massive adoption of head mounted displays of the day so we had to shift our approach and that's when we enabled some of the uh, dlp projector televisions mitsubishi's and samsung's to be 3d to be compatible with our system and then we were showing videos and um computer-generated virtual reality environments uh, on a Samsung television and a Mitsubishi television. That was not our, our original focus. Everything we did was based and targeting the head-mounted display. Uh, as of today, we believe that's the best way to experience um, virtual reality and, and, and stereoscopic experiences. Um, so we decided to focus on the content and uh, we required some high quality content and uh, we were inviting companies um, in, the, in, the, in the realm of uh, entertainment like uh, Disney and Warner Brothers and, and many other companies to, to provide us with content so we called um, encoded and presented in our format, in our Blu-ray format. Um, we, we, we actually got a hold of uh, many content, we were the, one of the first companies, if not, well, the first company to show uh, this high quality content and video games. We were showing uh, three-dimensional uh, stereoscopic immersive video games running on an Xbox and a PlayStation and Blu-rays, compatible Blu-rays in 3D. Uh, we, we went for the standardization of, of these processes and um, successfully we, we achieved a place in the standard for the MBC. And, and well, the industry uh, embraced the idea, and um, it was interesting to see all this evolution happening. Um, once they got to see the kind of experience and the kind of impact that content makes in the user when when perceived uh, in such a way with with the stereoscopic immersive experiences that's when they they decided to support a lot of the of the 3d to the home initiative um now we are facing a, a different stage the circumstances the environment is different the possibilities have changed now we have content we have the processing power we can create any virtual uh, environment and we can run it on pretty much every platform um Given those circumstances, we decided that it was a, the right time frame to go full speed with uh, with our with a head-mounted display and a heads-up display for VR and AR that will really make the user uh, 
feel that they are inside a digital world without knowing that they are actually looking at a computer graphics image. That's our target. That's our goal. That's how we have uh, created our platform. And that's exactly what we are uh, promoting right now as Immersion Brelia uh, by integrating all these uh, technologies. In the past, we worked with many companies like Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, NASA, um, the University of Iowa, the University of Southern California. Um, um, we also work with the Northwestern University Hospital in Chicago. We work with many companies for integrating virtual experiences and, and, and uh, stereoscopic experiences. Um, now we believe it's the right time for doing things in a different way. Many companies are doing it, but we're doing it in a different way. We're doing it in a way where we offer a platform, an entire infrastructure, a, a healthy ecosystem for everybody to adopt. Um, basically, that's uh, that's our company. That's what we're doing. And our mission, as I said, is to accelerate human evolution based on all this expertise poured into one single company. That's our objective. Thank you, Colin. Wow, that was a very insightful, uh, Manuel. Um, so we can start the Q&A now. If anyone has any questions, they can uh, PM me. Um, just to start off, Manuel, um, when will your product be available? You kind of have three products. You have the Go product, you have the Pro product, and then you have the um, platform. And uh, also, another question is, are you, going to be license, are you going to be licensing this platform out to developers? Yes, that, those are all very good questions. And um, for our products, for our three products, the Pro, the Go, and the Alter Space, we have different timelines. Um, I'm glad to announce that we are entering mass production of the Go within the next few days. Um, and very soon, we're, you're, you're going to be able to have this product on the shelves, that's for the goal. Uh, regarding the pro version, we are targeting November 2014 for the beta tester unit, uh, which is currently a 3D printed unit. Um, and it, it's on deployment now. We are accepting pre-orders for both of them, the, the Go and the Pro. Um, the Alter Space is also part of the uh, early adoption program. Um, it's under development. It's an alpha version. Uh, we have some virtual reality experiences right now for both augmented and, and virtual reality. And um, we're going to be releasing uh, the beta version in November as well, along with the Go and along with the beta tester unit. So uh, a, a safe date to have the products, the first generation or the beta tester generations of each one of the products, a safe, a safe date is November 2014, um, based on our uh, timeline and our roadmap for technology development. So that's one question. And in answering your second question regarding the Alter Space um, platform, yes, we are opening our SDK for the developers to integrate their uh, experiences and uh, prepare their experiences to be part of the outer space. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty straightforward um, process. We're going to go through a, a quick certification process to assure the quality of the experience and some uh, basic um, parameters that we're going to be measuring. That's one thing. The second thing is uh, we're going to be providing the SDK for uh, supporting all our products. And uh, yes, we are opening the platform for developers. Um, it's going to be something they will have um, direct access to the SDK for, for, their, for them to implement their own initiatives. And, um, and likewise, the Alter Space is practically capable to drive any display in the world. So it's a, it's a display agnostic platform. Um, you can even run it in 2D, in a basic tablet, in a basic computer with a regular monitor. 
or you can you can go and jump in into the altar space with the Immersion Brelia Go or the Immersion Brelia Pro and, and start enjoying this immersive experience or any other head-mounted dis display for that case. Uh, clearly, uh, the best experience uh, we're trying to, to be, you know, our products to provide the best experience for the user. That's our goal. Um, I don't know if that answered your, your question, Colin. Uh, no, it, it definitely uh, did. Um, your AI, Eileen, um, A-I-L-E-E-N, uh, where does that fit into all of this? Can you explain more about that? Okay, sure. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little preview about that. And um, Eileen, uh, it, it stands for Artificial Intelligence Logical Electronic Emulation Neural Network. Um, so what it is, it's... Um, it's a it's a platform. It's an infrastructure that is focused on information and data analysis, pattern recognition, prediction, um, syntaxes, and context. Um, the the way we do that and the way we achieve that is by emulating the way that uh, your brain and my brain and everybody's brain work. And the way it works is by creating connections between different sets of neurons. Um, so what we're doing with Aline is that we are analyzing the information, the data, and the metadata of the users, what they are watching, what they are playing with, what they are learning, where, where are they located, and what objects they are interested on and watching inside the outer space as if they were right in front, I don't know, of a house or a car or a product. And all this information is converted into valuable decision tools by analyzing the pattern of a user, a group of users, a region, or, or it can be centered on an app it can be centered on a product, it can be centered on a region, a geographic region, or it could even be centered on a business. Um, Eileen has the capability to get all this scattered information that is being generated as part of the interaction of the user with the outer space, the products, the applications, and the content. And then Eileen will predict what are the most likely movies or apps that you really want to see based on your behavior, based on your history and your pattern. So the Eileen infrastructure is going to help us to really provide a targeted marketing environment where we are not speculating about what you want to see, but we are actually predicting very accurately what are your preferences. And that's what Eileen does. She can do that for any data set, any information of any kind. Information, data, images, videos, documents, products, sales, inventory. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what, what kind of data set you're trying to analyze if it's your previous purchase pattern or if it's the number of times that you have entered an application or the number of times you have seen one certain type of movies. It, it's, it's about analyzing that pattern agnostically and then predicting your next steps. Um, in that case, we can really provide companies with a very specific targeted marketing field. Um, that's what Eileen is going to do. Eileen is kind of a third stage in our implementation. First, we need to create the outer space infrastructure along with the um, Immersion Brelia Pro and the Go and, and other head-mounted displays need to penetrate the market. Then this marketplace and this ecosystem is going to be moving around uh, users that are having preferences and watching all this content or evaluating products 
and watching them inside the altar space as if they were in the store. They can they can purchase anything. They can visit places. They can ask for visualization of any kind. Uh, and and then that that behavior is generating information, geolocated information, uh, metadata information, interaction application. And that information we don't really need to know the user, and we're not going to be like invading the user privacy or anything. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be generating patterns out of that behavior. Um, that's what Eileen is going to do, but many things need to happen before Eileen actually jumps in into the altar space uh, and becomes your daily assistant. The whole idea is that in the near future, Colin and, and, and uh, all the audience uh, that is listening to us right now, is that we are going to uh, provide the user with exactly what they want inside a parallel universe in the outer space um, in a very intelligent manner. You can have in the future, and that's what we see happening in the next few years after the infrastructure, after the content, after the head mount displays flood, penetrate the market. Then we're going to see uh, very interesting applications about getting all this very valuable information. Um, that's when Eileen comes in. At this moment, it's a very early stage, and what we have with Eileen right now is running on different uh, scenarios and different applications in closed environments for data prediction pattern analysis. And just to give you three, three examples of how we are using Eileen's brain uh, or how we have used Eileen's brain in the past, it includes uh, the possibility of evaluating an image on an unmanned vehicle and deciding what route it should take based on the images that she's acquiring with the cameras without user intervention. We call that the see and avoid version. Uh, we also used Eileen for some pattern analysis of failure in different uh, production plants to identify um, where exactly the, the failure rate was going higher depending on the brand and the type and the maintenance of every plant. And uh, we also use Eileen's um, capabilities for generating a tool that will allow us to understand better uh, the behavior of a stereoscopic natural visualization versus computer-generated uh, stereoscopic visualization. And she was capable to identify patterns that will usually be impossible to see at simple sight. She was able to analysis, uh, to take an analysis and, and predict the behavior of certain software based on, on, on those uh, rules. And uh, it's, it's called back propagation. She can start learning uh, from experience like at the beginning. She didn't know anything. Now she's learning more and more and more and now she knows a lot of things. But she's not ready for the public at this moment. We have the early adoption program for her. And as I said, it's running in, in a few companies internally. Um, but yeah, that's that's Eileen. Um, have you seen the movie Her by any chance, Manuel? It seems like Eileen um, sounds a lot like the technology that's being used in that movie. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Yes, I have seen the movie Her. Uh, it was a recent movie. I guess it was released in 2014. In a few a few months ago, um, the interesting thing, calling is that Eileen has been up and running since 2011. Um, that's, that's when we started with, with the initiative of Eileen, probably before, I don't remember when we had the first conversations about this Eileen uh, engine to be active. So yeah, that was a very interesting movie. And also I, I can even give you the name of another movie that is very interesting and highly recommended. It's uh, the Transcendence movie. That's a very good movie with Johnny Depp. That's a very nice movie. And it also has a lot of interesting approaches and descriptions of what a neural network is. Um, um, so yeah, that, that, that's, that's along the line. Now here, the movie, it's probably a little bit of a stretched neural network, stretched in time and probably stretched in the way that feelings are handled. 
um, as of today, even if we, I mean, even when we are creating Eileen and, 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 and uh, we design, I, I architected her neural network, I can tell you that feelings, for many reasons, is something intrinsic to human beings. Um, even though when a synapse can be created for a memory, and, and that's clear that a computer can also create that kind of synapse for, I don't know if you recall when you were five years old and, and, and you know, you were in the living room and in the holidays or something. That's something you can remember very well if I, if I just describe it. And the same happens with Eileen. She can also go back and look at her previous neurons and, and replicate in, in time the, the memories, the equivalent of memories. But even though when she can perfectly recall what happened or what images were there or where, where was the action happening in her neural network, that won't trigger any emotion. So if, if, I, if I think about the first time you received a gift during Christmas, that is probably a very emotive way to think about the memory. And the human brain translates that into into joy, into happiness. That is something that is associated with, with the feelings. And even though, again, when I'm, when I'm creating the architecture of Eileen as a neural network, I can tell you that as far as I am concerned, there is no way to replicate the human feelings unless you actually hard code them. So the, the chemical reaction that happens in the brain of a person when these memories come up and you remember those, like, I don't know, like, uh, just like saying something out of, out of the blue, like, like, like everybody's first kiss. You, you have a fond memory of, of a first kiss. And, and that triggers a lot of emotions for everybody. Even though when that is perfectly available information over time for a neural network, there's no emotion, there are no tears. Uh, unless you actually program something to uh, every time you access that specific moment in time, you you trigger some kind of actuator. But but that that that's not the way we work. So hair is probably a little bit stretched on the feelings of of a neural network uh, because the way we see it, a neural network at this moment, being realistic, um, it has the capability to learn. It has the capability to predict that we're a few years ago from emulating human feelings at this moment, Colin. Wow, uh, awesome response. Um, but do you have anything in, in place to uh, kind of prevent what happens in here, like singularity? Uh, anything in place that will prevent that from happening? Yeah, well, um, definitely. Uh, <sighs> The way we structure the neural network is by um, targeting some parameters for maximization. So, giving an example, when we're, when we're uh, analyzing scattered data and scattered information, uh, let's, let's talk about um, the way that resources are provided today for education all over the world. So the information is there. We know how many millions of dollars are being deployed on every single school, on every single country, on every single city of every single county. Uh, we know that information of every, every, every pretty much every, everywhere. Um, having that information maximized information of where do we really need another school where exactly the kids are going to go if we open a new school what exactly are the characteristics of the new school that we need to open that kind of information can be predicted and analyzed and, and we need to we need to provide some parameters for maximization um, every time you have this um, um, back propagation methods uh, where the system is learning and learning and learning you you keep improving on the parameters maximizing on the parameters so we need to maximize for social benefit or you can maximize for your business benefit or your financial benefit or your health given those parameters that that is the kind of 
rules, the only kind of rules that you need to provide to Eileen. So you can say, hey, Eileen, maximize um, revenue for my company and minimize the cost. She will, she will be capable to analyze everything that you have in your inventory, your raw materials, your providers, who are the options, where you can get the thing, and when you can do it. So, so you have to instruct her or ask her the question. The fact that a neural network can start thinking by itself, that is, that is another step. That is probably a different step because analyzing patterns, predicting patterns is one thing. Now, taking conscience of or awareness of your surroundings and your environment and then start asking your own questions about the situation, that is going to be part of, of the neural network. Once, once the information is there, once the information is inside the neural network, and once you have all these cameras and microphones and files and data sets and everything is available on the network for, for the neural network, then, and only then, the neural network is going to start asking new questions about things that the neural network doesn't know and start, you know, thinking. That's going to be a very interesting step. step. And, and in my mind, the answer for that happening is going to be part of evolution. It's, it's a neural network evolution. It's going to happen inside the neural network. It's not something you need to program like, like today, if I want Eileen to identify something, I don't need to program anything. I just ask her. And she will find the information, gather the information, get the context, find the syntaxes, give me an answer. And that's fine. Um, and she's learning out of that answer. Now, as part of the neural network, there has to be something that says, okay, you don't have, you're not, you're, you're not being requested with a question, but you can start asking questions now. And that's when it's going to be very interesting. And I don't think we can stop that from happening if you give the, instru the right instructions or the right questions. Uh, but, but it's a fact. I mean, robots are program programming themselves to replicate themselves right now. And where is this all going? Well, we are getting robots. We are getting artificial intelligence. We are getting virtual reality. We are getting augmented reality. All these tools, all these technology tools are just for evolution, evolving as humans, evolving the technology, and uh, even to conquer new worlds, not only digital, virtual, outer space worlds, but also, you know, who knows, moving to a different planet or conquering different lands, you know, uh, that, we, that are currently not available or within our reach. Um, that is going to happen. It's not going to happen anytime soon, the fact that we think about singularity or, or the time where there's no, there's no more uh, increase. It, it, it's going to keep evolving. That's my, that's my position on that. Uh, it kind of sounds like uh, Eileen is Siri's mom um, in some context. Um, uh, the iPhone Siri, Siri's mom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that sounds interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a very measured uh, neural network. Let's call it like that. <laughs> um, just uh, the hardware, um, the hardware this thing can run. It sounds like it would be running on a massive supercomputer. Is is that kind of what you need in terms of hardware? Um, just give you an idea. Currently, I can have the running on my uh, laptop, Alienware laptop with GPU clusters working in parallel for her neural network. So, no, it's not a supercomputer, but for, for a very early stage, um, we are using the processing power of, of the GPUs and um, the whole massive project includes 
um, GPU farms and GPU clusters that are located on the cloud. If I give her that kind of processing power, she will not only be capable to attend every single request of the users or the data sets, but she will also have access to virtually infinite processing power just by, you know, just like today you virtualize servers, you're going to be virtualizing GPUs and, and, and GPU farms and renders. So um, that's going to be virtually uh, like an infinite processing power. And, and when we think about the fact that Eileen is not storing a lot of information locally, but it's actually gathering information in real time and just creating synapses that are abstract for us. It's not, even for programmers, I mean, they are, not, they are not even words. They are not even lines of code. They are not databases. It's, it's a synapse, and a synapse is a very abstract concept. It's, you can think about a synapse more like in the realm of a 3D data set with the points connected in a three-dimensional virtual world, and, and that's precisely what Eileen's neural network is, and that's why I'm using the GPUs. But it's not something I can read. It's not like I can look at Eileen. Um, hello, everyone. It seems that Manuel might have dropped up. Oh. Never mind. There we go. Go ahead, Manuel. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, so, um, can you hear me now? Yep. Everyone can hear you. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, what I was telling you is that um, the fact that we have a neural network in Eileen brain running on GPUs is because her neural network looks more like a 3D data set of points connected in a spatial three-dimensional, multi-dimensional mm, array rather than a database or, or lines of code. That's why she can recognize any letter uh, by using only three or s uh, four lines of code. The whole process is happening in her neural network. Um, hey, Manuel, it seems that you might have gone a lot quieter. Uh, do you think you can pick up your mic a little bit? How about now? Can you hear me better? How about that? Can you hear me better now? I'm just asking the audience because I can hear you fine. Okay. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, that, that's Eileen, and, and um, that's her neural network. It, it resembles more a three-dimensional data set with uh, multi-dimensional vectors going everywhere rather than a database. So that's Eileen. And we're planning to use Eileen in the future to connect all the metadata and the information that is generated by every single user and product and geolocated and QR code and RFID tag and barcode and SKUs for every single piece of data to really obtain valuable information for marketing and advertising. That's the plan. Okay, well, thanks a lot for uh, answering that, Manuel. Uh, it seems like all our questions are done for now, but uh, that was a very insightful talk. Uh, that was talk hearing about Eileen and how advanced the technology has come uh, that you have there is very unique. Uh, um, and I, I'm sure you can do a lot with that in the future. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. And uh, eventually we're going to be, you know, providing access to Eileen for many applications out there in the world that we know that they can benefit from using her neural network. So yeah, we'll keep you posted. Uh, right now our, our efforts are focused on uh, immersion Brelia. Uh, we have to change the world one step at a time. And we're gonna start with virtual reality, augmented reality, head mounted displays, heads up displays. And then we're moving with artificial intelligence, Colin. All right, awesome. Thanks a lot, Manuel. Um, thank you for taking the time to talk, and uh, hopefully, hopefully you come back again to speak. Sure, thank you very much for the invite, and thank you everyone in the audience. And uh, I'm really looking forward to look at the proceedings of this 
conference. Thank you very much. All right. Bye, Manuel.